Hello and welcome to the interview on France 24. We're here in Kiev with David Arahamia, head of President Volodymyr Zelensky's Servant of the People Party and a close associate of the president since his electoral triumphs in 2019. But a lot has changed since then. I'm sure you weren't expecting, or I hope you weren't expecting, the situation Ukraine is in today. Perhaps I could start by asking you, as we're coming up to the one-year anniversary of the full-scale invasion, how you felt on that day and how you're feeling now. Yeah, that day was uh, a big uh, shock for everyone, although there was a lot of uh, pre-warnings, uh, failed warnings that we had missed first day of invasion potential, then second day, third day, uh, and when the fourth uh, attempt was. So we were sitting in Zelensky's office uh, for until I think one o'clock a.m. No, nothing happened. So I went out home. I said like, just like call me if something happens. Came back, I have uh, six kids. So everybody was at home uh, basically. Uh, and uh, I went to the bed uh, and uh, I think four o'clock a.m. Around four o'clock, I got a call from Mr. Yermak, head of the presidential office. He said like, it started, uh, come over to the office. So I was like, uh, I did not hear the uh, explosives and everything, so I was just sleeping. Uh, so when I woke up, uh, quickly brushed my teeth, uh, talked to uh, my wife and says like, uh, I will call you later once I know more details, but be prepared, maybe you get some suitcase and kids if needed to be moved somewhere. So, and I went to the office. When I came there in the office, there were already like quite a few people, five or six people. We already got established the connection with the military, the video conference devices and so on. And I've recognized that so many uh, bases, the military bases were hit at the same time, you know, and uh, everybody was a little bit, you know, disoriented at the, at the beginning. But it very, very quickly during a few hours, Everybody already got into the mood when we need to solve all, all the issues. It was a time when we had um, not concrete responsibilities, but it was like a more, I call, startup atmosphere when everybody, if you feel that this thing needs to be solved, you don't ask if it's your job or someone else's job, you just do the job. And we were living in these conditions first, I think, about one month when you know like everything was mixed and after one month after we realized what is the, um, the area of the front what are our resources what are their resources and so on it started to be structural but initially it was unstructural and that day also started with a speech from vladimir putin very early in the morning he's made a few speeches since then including one this week how do you evaluate the evolution of Putin's discourse? Well, they, I think Putin realized completely that it was a big mistake by him because he was scaring the whole world with this second army in the world, you know, symbol. And it never were, it worked, you know, like I think that before he started the aggression, he was looking for everybody else much more uh, serious and much, much more, you know, sophisticated than uh, after the aggression. That this is the the main issue for him, because so many countries realize that he has, like, you know, just uh, words, but not uh, real actions and now not real resources. Once people saw so how, how many thousands of tanks we destroyed and how it was happened, and people on the street did this job against this professional military personnel. So I think a lot, a lot, he lost influence, you know, at least three, four times, you know, in, his, in the world. But it was looking for internal, it's internal speech, let's face it. It's not for everybody else to watch. But he did also like very important message about uh, discontinuing or what he called pause on this uh, strategic weapons uh, and missiles, nuclear missiles agreement. Should and we be worried about that? Yeah, I think that it's like the whole world has to be realizing. Even some countries who were sympathizing, you know, him himself, that they should stop because this is clear message that I will not obey any post-war two rules. That uh, there was an agreement between the whole world, and I will do my own thing, which I think is very disturbing message to everyone who lives on this planet, including China and India and other countries which are now still partnering with Russia. 
In the early weeks um, of this full-scale war, I think you were part of a team that was negotiating with the Russians. Right, is that right? right? What was it like negotiating with them? Uh, do they say very different things in private than they did in public? Yes. Uh, first, uh, they they different, behave differently uh, publicly and privately. Um, the second thing that when the first time when we, we went to Belarus for the first meeting with this negotiation teams, it was like a very strange feeling because uh, there were uh, Russian troops around the Kiev, so we did not really know if we would return back to the same location when we were when we came out because the logistics took like uh, 36 hours you have to go by train first to Poland in Poland they give you uh, Black Hawk you know NATO type of helicopters you fly with helicopters to Belarus military base and then, then Belarusian Russian uh, basically Soviet Union type of helicopters you receive and then go to this place where the negotiation take place. When the first we uh, sat on the table they gave their what they call peace agreement. They call it peace agreement which I immediately called it's a capitulation agreement because if you you just like politely try to mask and hide this world because they say you have to demilitarize, they have to give this territories, this and this and this. So this is only capitulation. If it's a capitulation, we're talking capitulation, we go back and see how the war uh, progresses and so on. Was it already back then talking about the four um, regions that Russia claimed to have annexed in September? Yes, on back then it was not. The, I, I think that they said that we need to put uh, change the constitution three times you know, put the Russian language as official language, a lot of uh, unacceptable, and even if somebody would be stupid enough to accept this, it's not even doable in the uh, parliament during our law. So it's not feasible at all, which I think was a good start for us, the basis because I did not reject any of their demands, I was just discussing them said, okay, you want to change the constitution, how do you see how we can do it? And then I described how it's done by our law, and basically they quickly, after two, two types of negotiations, they recognize it's impossible to do. Even if somebody, I said, like, even if you take a gun, put on someone else's head and say, like, you have to do it, and he wants to do it, it's not possible to do it. And once I described this unrealistic scenarios, so they started to a little bit tweak the document. Did you at any point really think that these negotiations might lead to anything, actually? I think they wanted uh, to make it uh, because they, they were feeling a, like a strong position back then. And they were thinking that we would be weak, so they would be actually like what they did with Minsk Agreement. The Minsk Agreement was reached out when uh, they put, you know, rounded basically our forces. And we had very, very complex choice either to sign something or to get uh, most of our soldiers killed. So they, I think that they were kind of like in their heads having this type of ultimatum you know, document in, in mind saying that maybe tomorrow we will take over Kiev. And did you have any hope going there that you might actually be able to negotiate something acceptable to Ukraine? Well, when we started, I said, uh, to, I asked the, the president, because I'm not a professional diplomat, right? So, like I said, like, what would be the task? What would, would we consider as a successful negotiation? And he gave a clear task. He said, like, you don't have to sign anything. You just need for them to start uh, feeling that we are negotiable, negotiatable, I think, right? So, uh, and th that was the idea. So, like, I, that's why I kind of pretended, okay, we take your document as a draft. Let's start talking about this. You should know that when they just invaded, they did not recognize Zelensky and us as a legitimate power. They said this is like the power after Maidan, it was a legal revolution and so on. After we started to talk about the document, next, after the first session, Putin from the TV said we recognize power of Zelensky, he is a legitimate president and then we, we should continue talking. So this was uh, the main strategy. So I think that the intermediate goal uh, to be successfully start talking to them so they recognize us as a party and we stop this, you know, bullshit talk about Ukrainian power is not legitimate power. So we kind of passed this. I did not believe that we will sign a peace deal because like the uh, conditions that they were offering and they did not even want to listen to uh, to the argument that, you know, like it is uh, Ukrainian territory. The whole world, all the countries recognize except some 
very strange, you know, countries. So back uh, then, President Zelensky wanted you to show that you were open to negotiations, but now Ukraine is officially not open to negotiations with Russia. That's yes, correct. because after Bucha, actually, we exited the negotiation. So when it was just started, there was one position after Bucha. Uh, we had one uh, session with them after Bucha, when on this session they tried to persuade me that the Bucha operation and the results, it was a joint a fake operation by British special forces and Ukrainians. And I want to ask you, though, do you come under any pressure from Ukraine's Western allies to, as it were, reopen the negotiations? We hear various figures saying at some point this will have to end with negotiations. Does Ukraine accept that, that it will have to be? We have uh, this uh, 10 steps um, uh, peace plan by Zelensky, which uh, uh, generally accepted by all the international partners. So the document is open, so there is no need uh, to start negotiations before they give at least soft commitment that they are ready to go uh, on this plan. And the first uh, article of the plan go out uh, where you've been before the war started. Would if they you are at not any going... point agree, for example, to open negotiations about the status of Crimea? I think that you, we already gave a clear sign to everybody that, you know, like that uh, Ukraine uh, became independent country, recognized by United a Nations and the whole world. Uh, in certain borders, 1991. In 1994, Ukraine was one of the most powerful holders of nuclear weapon. So Russia signed, US signed, France uh, signed a document, Budapest Memorandum, guaranteeing that Ukraine destroys all the nuclear uh, power inside. And in exchange, all these countries, guarantors, will guarantee its uh, borders, including Crimea. I want to Why quickly ask you, because we don't have much time, about Joe Biden's visit. Yeah. Um, what message did you get from him? And um, were you there when Zelensky was taking him to shake everybody's hands and it looked like Zelensky was shedding a tear? Was that genuine emotion because he was so moved about uh, Joe Biden's visit? Yeah, actually, uh, it was a great visit. I think it was a great symbolic visit for everybody in Ukraine because uh, Russia propaganda did not stop working. And one of the propaganda messages is that uh, everybody's got fatigue, war fatigue after a year. So like you will be abandoned and then Russia will take over the country back. You killed everybody who was against and so on. So this uh, visit was very, very uh, symbolic for us. David Arahami, I think that's all we've got time for. Thank you very much for you. speaking to France 24. And thank you for watching. Stay tuned for more.